Hello, my name is Rebecca Barnfield. I'm one of the PGY2s in the Royal College Emergency Medicine program. And myself alongside Caroline and Wendy are going to be presenting today on human trafficking. I have the honor of presenting alongside two experts, Caroline Pugh Roberts and Wendy Goldsmith. Caroline works in peer support outreach for the Salvation Army Correctional and Justice Services and is a registered expert on human trafficking. Wendy is an advocate and counselor at the London Abused Women's Centre and a trainer for the Ontario Strategy to End Human Trafficking. Now, before we start, I would just like to acknowledge the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenapawak, and Chenongtan nations of which the lands, those of us in London, are gathered upon today. Of course, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. And before we start, I just briefly wanted to give a bit of a content warning. This presentation contains information about human trafficking, sexual violence and abuse. So please excuse yourself as needed, turn your mic off, turn your camera off, step away and take some time for self-care afterwards. Our objectives today are to define human trafficking and its relevance to emergency medicine, explore the prevalence of human trafficking in Canada, develop a clinical approach to human trafficking in the emergency department, discuss the provision of trauma-informed care to trafficked individuals, and then we'll touch upon some practical considerations for care, and then explore the resources that we have available to us locally. Now, I wanna start off with a case to frame our thinking for this presentation. So there's a 27 year old female. She's found with decreased LOC downtown after EMS was called by a concerned bystander. Upon arrival, she has a decreased level of consciousness. She has respiratory depression and pinpoint pupils. So naloxone is administered by EMS. She receives a dose at the scene and then requires a second dose on transport. When she arrives to the department, EMS and triage discuss that she is quite well known to both staff for frequent visits with substance related concerns. Her vitals and level of consciousness are stable upon arrival, so she's offloaded and then brought to Blue One. While she's in the department, her boyfriend presents to the triage desk requesting to speak with her, but due to the COVID restrictions at the time, he's not allowed in. He becomes quite aggressive and has to be escorted out by security. 20 minutes later, your patient is heard to be calling out from her stretcher in blue one requesting care. She's endorsing abdominal pain, asking to be seen by a doctor, asking why things are taking so long and saying things like, can't you, can't you see that I'm in pain? Don't you care? So you sign up to see her, but you notice that while she's being assessed, she's on her phone, she's disengaged. She's responding to text messages. You talk about her vague concerns, which are generalized abdominal pain for the last number of months. You order some labs and some other investigations, but unfortunately, while those are pending, she becomes agitated and aggressive with the nursing staff and then leaves the department without being reassessed. My aim through our case illustration here is to assist us in recognizing individuals who may present with features concerning for human trafficking, and also to reframe the lens in which we view these individuals who are at risk, who may present with behavior similar to above. I also hope that we can develop an approach to trauma-informed care and supporting the patients that we see who may be trafficked. While we go forward, consider this case. Uh, so that's my slide. Good morning, everybody. Um, so if, it's important first to define what human trafficking is according to the law and um, Canada adopted the United Nations definition um, and uses that to determine what is trafficking. So in order for a, a situation to be considered human trafficking, there has to be an act. So the trafficker has to uh, either recruit or, or harbor or, um, or transfer or transport a person. There has to be means, which is usually coercion or force or deception, and there has to be a purpose, and the purpose is for exploitation, sexual exploitation. Can you go to the next slide. Uh, good morning, everybody. There's um, there's a fair amount of types of exploitation, but we primarily see in Canada is the sexual exploitation and the forced labor. But there is that bondage, domestic servitude, which you can also see here, organ removal, which I think we're going to see here, forced begging, child soldiers, and forced marriage, which is another one that we do see here. 
And there's a difference between forced marriage and arranged marriage. Forced marriage is when one or both do not want to actually marry and have no options. Okay. Next slide, please. How does human trafficking occur? Um, here are some stats for you. We see the friend visit, the kidnapping, the marriage, labor, migration, educational opportunities, uh, sold by non-families, sold by family, and boyfriend. But now what we're gonna see and what you're going to see primarily and overwhelmingly so is the boyfriend, which also goes by lover boy pimp slash trafficker scenario. And this is really important uh, because you're gonna have to figure out how to separate them if they're there together. We also have personal contact, which is like 84.6%. And by that, um, uh, they are introduced to the boyfriend or it's a friend who does it. The other means is 11.2. Personal contact slash other is also 4.9. Employment agencies is 4.2, but that primarily will be labor trafficking. Internet advertisement, 2.1%. And I, I do want to stress that the internet um, means of trafficking is rising exponentially during COVID. And then again, we've got personal contact, employment agency, and other is 0.7%, which are the means of recruitment. Thank you. Wendy? So to understand the law in Canada, uh, it's important to know that it is illegal to purchase sex or to uh, sell somebody else for sexual exploitation or to advertise somebody else's sexual services. So it is, it is a criminal act to, to do all of those things. However, a woman cannot be criminalized for selling her own sexual services. So that is a big difference and a very important distinction. So it's the pimps, the johns, the brothel owners, et cetera, who are um, risking criminal, um, criminal charges if, if they're caught. Uh, okay, demographics, yeah. So in Canada, here are some statistics. Um, we know that uh, overall there have been almost 2,500 incidents of trafficking reported to police. Uh, just under 1,400 victims of this crime were in Canada between 2009 and 2019. So that's the, the stats that we have. We do know, however, that uh, human trafficking is largely underreported. There are many reasons for this. There are many reasons that uh, a woman or girl uh, or a person being trafficked would not want to speak to police. There's a lot of uh, threats and coercion re uh, related to trafficking by the pimps. And uh, so those numbers are definitely lower than what we know is happening. Um, in Ontario, sorry, in Ontario, um, it's well above the national average. We know that because of the 401 corridor uh, and also some legislation that we have in terms of child welfare, that uh, Ontario is actually a safe haven for traffickers and they use um, the, the corridor to go up and down to our major cities um, and London, of course, being right in between Toronto and Windsor. So um, we do see a high, high number of trafficking incidents, incidents in London. Okay, so the demographics, 97% of the victims are female. 45% of the ages are 18 to 24 and 28% are under 18. Having said that, since COVID started, we are seeing a rise in the lowering of the age of these victims because so many children have been at home. So just be aware that these, these uh, ages don't, don't stick to them only. The traffickers, 81% are male, 51% are over 25, but we are seeing 12 year olds trafficking victims. 3% of youth uh, are aged 12 to 17 as, as uh, traffickers, and 92% of victims knew the trafficker prior. And that's important because we hear all these things on the internet about kidnapping. It's very, very, very rare. And in here, you will see that often there will be a female trafficker. And the reason for that usually is because she's also a victim and has been given the option to recruit or traffic in order not to have to work as much. So you can't just assume if you see two women together that they, it's a safe combination. Thank you. 
So when we talk about trafficking, it's important to know that um, any woman or girl, any one of us is at risk of trafficking just by virtue of the gender that we are, the sex that we were born with. Uh, however, what traffickers do is they look for the, the low hanging fruit, the easy prey. So uh, vulnerable youth, uh, people living who, who are homeless, um, who may have some kind of a mental illness or substance use. Uh, dis disorder that they can they can um, prey upon. Um, kids who live in foster care group homes who are already um, struggling with attachment and and it's very easy for a trafficker to uh, to walk in and 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 present the picture of love and, and attention and caring that that these kids um, have been looking for so bad so much. Um, often, uh, if there's a history of uh, childhood sexual or physical abuse. Um, or kids that are already involved in the justice system and don't trust authority, et cetera. Uh, and it's very important to mention uh, our indigenous and racial, racialized um, mm -hmm. girls and, and women who have been trafficked. Indigenous people make up 20% of the population of Canada, but they are about 51% of the um, individuals who are trafficked in Canada. And the age for trafficking indigenous youth is, is younger. The average age is 12. Um, 12 years old, so prepubescent. Um, LGBTQS plus youth also, um, and especially males and, and those who identify as trans. Uh, anybody, again, who has some kind of vulnerability that the trafficker can exploit. So human trafficking is very relevant to us in healthcare. There was a study performed by Letterer and Wetzel in 2014, and it showed that 99.1% of survivors had a health problem while they were trafficked. 88% of survivors had an encounter with a healthcare provider while they were trafficked, and it was not recognized. 63% of survivors reported seeking care specifically in the emergency department while they were trafficked. And only 2.1% of survivors who access services to help them um, with support or exit were actually referred by a healthcare professional. The others were referred by local law enforcement, shelters, social services, et cetera. Now, why are these people coming into the emergency department and to other healthcare settings and not being identified? Lack of education certainly is a major barrier to us when we're caring for individuals who have been trafficked. There was a scoping review of 17 studies regarding educational intervention on human trafficking for emergency providers, including RNs, sexual assault nurse examiners and physicians that was performed. The intervention included a brief didactic session at a departmental meeting um, or things like shift change handover ED conferences and provided, providing reading resources. These educational set sessions focused on recognizing the signs of trafficking, discussed local resources, had advice from experts in the field, and then discussed case narratives. The findings on the pre-survey showed lack of formal education on human trafficking amongst providers as a major reason for the lack of confidence in caring for trafficked individuals and a lack of confidence in the provider's knowledge on human trafficking. In one study, 100% of the respondents stated that they had no formal training on human trafficking. Their findings showed that even brief educational interventions on human trafficking improved provider knowledge and confidence in caring for trafficked individuals as measured by pre and post surveys. So it is important to be doing sessions such as this. So next we're going to go into a clinical approach to human trafficking. Okay, so this is what you may see uh, and experience with a victim. Extreme startle response, the hypervigilance. Uh, perhaps you might close the curtain and they might say, don't close it, I can't see what's going on. Uh, and that might appear odd, but it's a survival instinct in them. Disruptive, combative, or aggressive behavior. Um, I know this wouldn't, won't, wouldn't be easy for you to manage or, or deal with, but having said that, it's how they survive in that environment. So it's actually a normal response to an abnormal scenario for them. They can be disengaged or withdraw because they have no agency in their actual life or speaking out 
causes them to be hurt. This one is really important, the persistent visitor, friend or partner. That would be the trafficker. And, and an indicator that this person that they're with is not okay is that they do not allow the patient to speak. Or when that person's around, the patient is always looking at the ground, not meeting anybody in the eye, because that is one of the rules. And separating them is ideal. Lack of, identi of identification is a classic scene because they can't really run if they have no ID. Another red flag, which is a good one that you can assess, is unaware if they're unaware of their address or surroundings. And I'll give you an example. Everybody knows where their local Tim Hortons or Shoppers Drug Mart is. If that person does not know, there's an indicator that they don't know where they are. So that's a good question you can ask. Thank you. So presentation of the history. Discrepancy between reported story and injuries, injuries and illness. You'll see this in DV, domestic violence too. They don't want to disclose who hurt them. There's also something, well, disassociative, uh, disassociation. They have trouble with chronology because everything's just a blur for them. So if they say something and it doesn't match with their, how they're presenting, don't just assume they're lying. It could be, well, it's probably how they're surviving. Uh, delay in seeking care is classic because they're simply not allowed to. They're lucky that they got to you at all. So this is your chance. Um, or frequent uh, emergency department visits. The reoccurring STIs is huge because the traffickers do not allow them to use protection and the customers don't want it. Unwanted pregnancies, regularly we see a lot of um, uh, repeat abortions. A substance use disorder is classic because that's how they survive and or the traffickers are forcing them to use the drugs in order to keep control of them because then they're not only their trafficker, but they're also their drug dealer. Chronic pain is classic and you may not be able to figure what it, out what it is, but it's there. Anxiety, depression, those go hand in hand with it also. Thank you. So some physical findings of people that uh, may be trafficked, evidence of physical or sexual violence, things like burns, lacerations, vaginal or rectal trauma. This could be a presentation in someone who is trafficked or someone experiencing domestic or sexual violence. These patients may present with malnutrition or dehydration, or they may have untreated chronic illnesses. If they're using a fake form of identification, there may be a discrepancy between their stated age and their suspected age, and this is relevant especially for pediatrics. And they may present with inappropriate dress for the weather, so things like wearing shorts or a dress and flip-flops with a coat in the middle of winter. This is another big one for you. Um, they call it branding, but it can be it can actually be a burn brand or tattoos. And here's some examples, but what you'll often see is property of tattooed. And you may see property of different ones with different names, which means she's been sold to the, those different traffickers. So this is, a really, this is an absolute red flag if you see this kind of tattoo. And I would, be, I, would call, I would use caution questioning her on it. You know what it is. And this is an indicator for you because this may frighten her or if the traffickers there cause a problem for her. So you will often see uh, tattoos or actual burn brandings. Thank you. So now is a chance for a little bit of audience participation. As a reminder, the case that we touched upon was the 27 year old female that was found unconscious, abdominal pain, an agitated boyfriend, and then she herself became disengaged and left without being reassessed. So we've learned some red flags. Is there anybody who feels comfortable um, discussing some things that they may have noticed in this case? And feel free to just unmute and... Hi, Rebecca, I'll go ahead. Thanks, um, So I think, you know, the, the red flag that uh, stands out at first is, is sort of the nature of, of the event. She's unconscious downtown. Um, I mean, it's sort of common for us to see those, but it's also sort of a uh, history with sort of unknown circumstances. Uh, after that, I would say that the substance misuse is, is another potential red flag. 
the the bag abdominal complaints um agitated boyfriend is sort of the big one i think that's sort of the 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 one that i think uh would actually trigger us to go down the pathway of of uh someone who's being trafficked and then the agitated disengaged and and llama pathways is, is again like a lot of these are, are very common for us and i think that's the, the importance of this talk but i think that the thing that stands out the most is the agitated boyfriend who's sort of not happy being separated thank you colin so yeah just on the slide here i, I agree with most of what colin said the visitor wishing to see the patient becoming aggressive is certainly one of the major red flags but things like substance use frequent emergency visits also, the psychological consequences of trauma that may manifest as agitation, hostility, disengagement, and the fact that this patient is constantly on her phone. Um, she may uh, have to have constant communication with her trafficker um, to ensure her own safety and fear of, you know, being injured if they aren't able to respond is something that certainly can happen as well. So I, I think it's really important for you to know that in London, Ontario, trafficking does happen in every neighborhood um, across so socioeconomic status as well. So you will see these folks in your, your ER. There's no doubt about that. Um, also, it's really important. The most important thing that you can do is to uh, begin to build and establish a trusting relationship with that person. Uh, if you if they have an opportunity to, to disclose to somebody, um, if they aren't met with um, messages like I see you, I hear you, I believe you, they may never disclose again and they may never receive the support that they need. Um, it's also very important to know that, um, you know, uh, police intervention is not necessarily um, the best intervention and and exiting is not necessarily the goal of your first encounter with this person. Um, oftentimes uh, an encounter with police uh, does not support the victim. And so it's, it's really important not to jump to that at the very beginning, but to um, know what resources in, are in the community. And we're gonna talk about that towards the end uh, and, and then be able to say, you know, there are good people at uh, London Abuse Women's Center or Salvation Army that you can talk to uh, if, if, you, if you want to. So believing and seeing and hearing are the, mo are the keys. Uh, while you're managing the present the, the medical concern um, if if these these victims are often told to not tell anybody what's happening to them for fear of being hurt or their families being hurt their pets being hurt um, and they're also convinced many times that they are equally um, complicit in the crime, which is of course not true, but that's a one way that traffickers use to lure them back in that, you know, if you tell you're going to go to jail, not me. Uh, so there's a lot of manipulation and um, psychological and emotional control that is happening. Um, so, uh, you know, in the ER room, it's critical that you uh, just listen and, and watch for the signs that we've discussed and just ask questions in a very open, non-judgmental way. And that's the way you're going to establish trust and hopefully elicit some kind of acknowledgement and then you can connect to resources. Okay, barriers to disclosure. Wendy uh, uh, talked a fair amount about that, but it's important to note that even though it's she or he, because I am working with male victims, uh, appear to be safe, their families have been threatened. I know somebody who had a trafficker sit outside their home with a gun in his lap in his car and watch the family house. They had to put in security. So to look at her, you'd think nothing. Meanwhile, there was a lot going on. There's also the stigma and shame of doing it. I mean, society is very biased and very judgmental. They may be incredibly embarrassed to admit it. Uh, this is the big one. Most victims do not have the word trafficking in their vocabulary, so they don't self-identify. And because we see it in the boyfriend scenario, they will tell you that my boyfriend wouldn't do that. And if you approached it from that angle, they might get offended with you and shut down. And like I said, they're not in a position to leave for various things that you can't always see. If they do disclose and are unable to leave, they're gonna get hurt. Each person here in Canada makes about $350,000 for the trafficker each year. 
they take care of $350,000 in that they don't want to lose it. So they will hurt her or him. Uh, previous criminal record could be an issue. There might be a warrant out for them. Fear of being reported to the authorities. Now, often we see in conjunction with the trafficking of sexual, for example, they're forced to run drugs, they're forced to run guns. So the trafficker will tell them, if you tell on me, I'm going to tell on you. So there's, it, it's not what you could just see going on. Another one really big is feeling invalidated or judged in the healthcare setting. Around this, the biggest thing I can give you to take away is check your bias. Just because they present a certain way doesn't mean this is what they wanted for their lives. It's a situation they have found themselves in. The lack of privacy in healthcare setting is a big one. If they're with the tra trafficker, whether it be a male or a female, if you can separate them, that's the ideal. And if that person is on the other side of the curtain, just be cognizant of the fact that they can still hear. So you might wanna write down a question and let that person write back or point so that the person outside the curtain cannot hear what is being disclosed. Thank you. So I know that, that we talk a lot about trauma-informed care and don't always talk about what that means. And so I like this definition of trauma. Um, people who have been trafficked are, are most often subjected to repeated, many, many repeated acts of sexual, physical, psychological violence, sometimes uh, multiple times during one day. And that obviously has a significant negative impact on their physical and mental health. And, and that will show up in, in various forms. It might show up in your ER as um, uh, uh, some stomach pain is common because you know often uh, they're, they're not eating well, they're eating on the run or their, their food is being controlled by the trafficker. They're taking in a lot of drugs. Um, so stomach pain is something that you would frequently see. Um, but the, tra the trafficked, people have a disconnect. They've been removed from their family, from their friends, from their any cultural systems that they have. Um, and, and they've been pulled into this culture where they're in a constant state of fight, fright, sorry, fight, flight, or freeze. Uh, and that will come up if, if um, something triggers them in, a, in, a, in an examination, for example. Um, a good example I have, not in an ER, but I have a woman I'm working with who um, was trafficked uh, and exited and has been exited for several years, has been doing very well, uh, and then went into a store with her children and she smelled the cologne of her trafficker and she panicked and she went into a complete trauma response. She gathered up her kids and ran them out of the, the store the kids had no idea what was going on and of course there was no immediate threat but the trauma response the the vicarious trauma that she was feeling um around that that sense that that she experienced when she was being trafficked was profound and and it may very well show up in the emergency room as well so when we talk about trauma-informed care again um it, we want to recognize that uh that that violence is part of their life and um, they may um, push back. They may not be, appear as cooperative, uh, but that is really because they are trying to keep themselves safe. Um, sorry, my screen just went black. <laughs> Hang on. Can you still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Wendy. Okay, sorry, just take, give me one second. Okay, there it's back. Um, so trauma-informed care is really understanding that the impact that trauma has had on, on people and that the way you may be expecting them to present or respond or behave may not at all be the way that they do in the ER. They're under a great deal of stress and pressure. They're in the ER. ER because something physical is wrong, but also they have the pressure of, um, you know, all this authority and all of these questions being asked of them. Um, so we should always assume that that everybody has experienced trauma. If you if you are interested in addictions work at all, 
Gabor Mate talks about uh, trauma and, and he posits that, that all of us have experienced some form of trauma in our life and that it does create a response. So being aware of that and understanding that, that, that trauma unique to traffic victims is profound uh, is, a, is one way that you can um, help to build that trusting relationship so that um, they will perhaps disclose more to you about what's really going on. And, and, know, and know the supports in the community, know the services that we're going to talk about in a minute. And just quickly to touch upon what trauma-informed care can mean in an emergency department setting, it's things like sitting at a patient's level um, or crouching beside their stretcher or sitting them up in bed to talk to you instead of keeping them laid flat, um, calling it a stretcher instead of a bed like I just did, um, ensuring that the curtain is pulled and making sure that the visitors are outside in the waiting room instead of outside those curtains. Um, having uh, discussions take place when a patient is closed or covered to kind of neutralize that power differential. Making sure you're asking consent, like, is it all right if I, rather than telling and saying, I'm going to do this to you, warn the patient if you're going to touch them. So if you're going to feel me touch your shoulder, talk them through exams and what to expect. Let them be part of the decision-making process in terms of the care that you're providing. And then just recognizing that there are certain aspects of clinical care that are inher inherently violent or re-traumatizing um, and just knowing to try to minimize that at all times. Um, also important to touch upon restraints. Of course, um, these are some things that are necessary for the safety of the patients and people, but recognize that we should minimize their use because it can be traumatizing in and of itself, but also re-traumatizing for people who have experienced trafficking or violence. Uh, I love what you just said about the power differential. Thank you. Um, okay, so things you can do. Be warm and compassionate. Now, I know that you're under pressure and there are time constraints in that environment. I really do. But if you can use authentic and simple language, like for the layman, because acronyms, they don't know. The, uh, I just did a survey of 80 women and the average level of education was between grade five and seven. So if you're using big words, they may um, think that you're trying to intimidate them, even though you're not. So if you can use terms for the layman, ideally you wanna meet the immediate, uh, immediate needs like Maslow's hierarchy, thirst, hunger, warmth, et cetera, because even today they're even withholding water from some of these victims in order to get them to go comply. And who doesn't feel better if they've had a meal in their tummy? Include the patient in treatment planning. That's to me is fairly obvious. Be welcoming, non-judgmental, like you said it before, check the bias. And again, approach with an attitude of non-judgment. Thank you. So don't, <laughs> don't comment on your appearance. Um, they may not have any other clothing or they may have been forced to. If they're using drugs, that's gonna be, you're gonna see it but they may be being forced to use the drugs. The medical jargon I've already um, talked about, chart during the encounter, because that is something that they don't know what, they don't understand what you're doing, what you're writing, they don't know. So that can frighten them. Rebecca touched upon this, use unnecessary force or physical restraint because that is fairly often their normal. Stack the questions. I use the term peppering, but, um, Bam, 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 hate them with questions. That becomes, this, that can be very, very overwhelming for them and they can withdraw or even disassociate at that point and you've, you're not gonna get anywhere with them. The impatience, judgment and dismissiveness is what they live with every day. They, it's like going home to abuse. If they have a space, one place where they can go and not experience this, hopefully it can be with you. That way they will come back. That way you can build rapport and support and hopefully they will eventually disclose to you. And don't ask them to recount the ex traumatic experiences because that's just gonna re-trigger them and it ca can cause them to start fearing you because traffickers are known for sending in what they call their soldiers and checking on her and finding out what she is disclosing in order to punish her if she's disclosing too much. So. I hope that it, um, the, what I've just said helps you understand how to treat her and why to treat her or him, I beg your pardon, that way. Thank you.
I just wanted to touch upon um, a tool called the PEAR tool. Um, it was created by an organization called Dignity Health. And the PEAR stand is an acronym. Um, and it gives us a basis for some trauma-informed care um, in healthcare settings for victims of human trafficking, but also people who have experienced sexual violence or domestic violence as well. Um, it's based on a universal education approach that focuses on educating patients about abuse, neglect, or violence instead of using screening questions, which can be um, triggering for individuals. And the goal of this is having a normalizing, informative conversation with patients. So the P stands for providing privacy. I think we've certainly touched on the importance of privacy in treating um, people who have survived or are experiencing um, human trafficking. Obviously, the eMERGE is a very busy place, and it can lead to people feeling judged, not just by the people providing care, but the people in the rooms beside them. So closing off the curtains, um, listing the patient as anonymous, having a visitor leave to the waiting room or leave the department in general. Um, and then if you're having trouble getting this patient to be in a private setting, ordering radio radiologic tests, having them go to the radiology department and going with them to have that safe conversation. Um, and just a reminder that a support person is not an appropriate translator, um, especially if you're concerned about their safety. The E stands for educate. And as we've mentioned earlier, many people don't identify as people who are being trafficked. They may not identify their boyfriend or their friend as their trafficker. And they may not know that what they're experiencing is trafficking, but it's important to meet them where they're at and focus on non-judgmental non education, not telling someone you're being trafficked, but actually just educating on them on what human trafficking is and you know, what the laws are in our local area. Um, using phrases like, I educate all of my patients about violence and human trafficking because it's so common in our society and it can impact our well-being. And then making sure that we have some type of local resource available for patients, um, like a brochure or an information pamphlet that they can take with them that provides local resources that they can access as well. Of course, if they decline the opportunity for this education, just respect them and making sure that you allow time for this discussion to happen. It can be five minutes of uninterrupted discussion and that can be enough. The A stands for ask. Um, once you've done the education, asking the patient do you ever feel that this has been an issue for you? Or do you ever feel like anyone is hurting your health or well being? Something general and non invasive. But if there are any specific concerns that you've noticed, for example, they have a number of different burn marks, you can say, I've noticed this and I'm just concerned about your health and safety. You don't have to share any details with me, but I'd like to connect you with resources if you're in need of assistance. Is this something that you're interested in? So you're not probing, you're not asking them to tell you what happened, but you're just telling them that you're concerned. And then the R stands for respect and respond. Respect the patient's wishes if they do not disclose or if they do disclose and they don't wish to receive supports and then respond if they do by providing resources if these are acceptable for them. Now, universal education and screening is certainly a more trauma-informed um, option, but recognizing the time constraints in the emergency department, screening questions can also be used. This table is from a study performed in 2016 by Muma et al. And it was a feasibility study for actually implementing a screening survey in their emergency department to identify survivors and victims of human trafficking. They took a convenient sample of patients that were four, aged 18 to 40, and then they did a 14 question survey. Um, then physician concern was also reported as a yes or no. So if they screened positive on the survey or physician concern, then they were offered a social work consult and then a true positive was a patient that had documentation of sex trafficking in their medical record. There was 143 enrolled patients and 27% of these 143 patients were identified as victims of human trafficking, specifically sex trafficking. Um, the sensitivity of the survey was 100% and physician concern was only 40. Um, but obviously physician specificity was much higher than the screening survey. Of course, this study has a number of flaws. It's single center, small sample size. The rate of human trafficking was quite high. Um, and all of the uh, confidence intervals are wide. But um, I do think that it does guide, um, provide some evidence to guide the questions that we're asking. So I've placed arrows beside some questions that um, have a high uh, true positive rate. Were you or anyone that you work with ever beaten, hit, yelled at, raped, threatened, or made to feel physical pain for working slowly or trying to leave? 
asking if anybody is forcing you to do anything that you do not want to do, asking if someone forces you to have sexual intercourse at the place that you work, does someone else control whether you can leave your house or not, and are you kept from contacting your friends or family whenever you would like. Now, what does helping actually look like? Um, the questions on the last slide have evidence behind them and asking the, but as, ultimately asking the most high yield question is not the most important aspect of caring for survivors of human trafficking and not necessarily the most trauma informed. I think the more important thing is to focus on the needs of that person and also ensuring their safety. Again, we're not trying to rescue these people. We're trying to respect them where they're at and approach with an attitude of non-judgment. I've said that a couple of times. Um, it's important to ask appropriate non-invasive questions in language that a person can understand. What do you need to feel safe? Is somebody hurting you or making you do things that you feel uncomfortable doing or you don't feel like doing? What do you need right now and how can I help you get that? And can I connect you to any supporting services? And as a reminder, it's always important to listen more than you talk. So now that we have discussed care considerations for a trauma-informed approach, I just want to touch upon applying this to the patient from case one. So of course she had immediate medical management priorities. She received naloxone. We started a workup for her, her abdominal pain, um, but there was also some immediate human needs that she may have needed. Something for her pain, a blanket, asking her if she needed something to eat, recognizing that somebody with abdominal pain is not the first, it's not the first thing that we need to do. Um, we ensured her privacy by not allowing the visitor, but in certain, certain circumstances, that is something that we need to do. And then asking gentle questions to follow up on her immediate safety needs during our first encounter with that patient. Questions like, do you have a safe place to stay? Who are your supports? Who do you live with? Do you have access to your own ID? And then if you're feeling worried, asking someone if they have to have sex or do acts that they don't feel like doing. Now, moving on to some practical aspects of care. In the emergency department, our role is to ensure firstly that we're addressing the medical concern of the patient. And this, if this concern necessitate, necessitates a speculum exam, this should be performed because it does not preclude evidence collection in somebody who is wishing to receive forensic testing. However, if you are doing a speculum exam using warm water instead of um, muco or lubricant, our next role is to ensure that the patients that we see are offered forensic testing if they are disclosing sex trafficking or any other form of sexual violence. However, we ourselves as emergency physicians will not be performing it. Sexual assault and domestic violence RNs can be paged through switchboard and are available 24 seven and they perform the forensic testing. They can facilitate either return to St. Joe's to the sexual assault and domestic violence treatment center or in certain high risk situations, they can actually attend UH or BIC to perform the testing there. Uh, referral to the SADV gives the person access to the many services provided there, which includes not only forensic testing, but STI and pregnancy testing, uh, pregnancy and HIV uh, prophylaxis, as well, as, and that's free of charge, as well as counseling and follow-up. In terms of timing for forensic testing, it should be done as soon as possible and ideally before the person showers but within 72 hours for pediatric patients and 12 days for adult patients is ideal. Um, then once the evidence is obtained, it is stored at the London Police Services for up to one year, but that does not mean that if forensic testing is performed that the police need to be involved. And lastly, another important role of the emergency physician is to ensure that we're not impeding the chain of evidence. So this begins in the eMERGE um, if we have to remove the clothing of a patient for their medical care. If the clothing or jewelry or anything has to be removed, it has to be stored in a clean plastic bag and it can't be out of our sight or away from the patient at any time. So it must be stored with the patient or on their stretcher below um, the stretcher, but it has to be kept with them. Now, thank you to Patrice. We have very recently done a deep dive into post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. So I'm just gonna briefly, briefly touch upon this for some spaced repetition. Um, it's recommended that um, combination post-exposure prophylaxis is to be given ASAP, but no later than 72 hours post-exposure. And the regimens are um, Truvada or tenofovir, emtricitabine, and dolutegravir once daily for 28 days, or Truvada 
aka tenofovir and tricytamine daily, and raltegravir twice daily for 28 days. In an ideal world, the like med to go pack is provided to the patient. Um, Vic has both of these uh, regimens, whereas UH only has the tenofovir and tricytamine. Um, so as I mentioned, ideally they take their meds to go and then they have follow-up with either sexual assault and domestic violence or infectious disease to ensure that they're monitored for seroconversion, monitored for side effects, have their labs done, et cetera. Um, additionally, as I mentioned, if they have that referral to SADV, the 28 day course can be provided free of charge. One thing specific to this population is that if we are not providing the 28 day script in the emergency department, this may preclude the patient from ever receiving a full course as often when somebody is being trafficked, they do not have the agency in their lives to be able to attend a follow-up appointment and to come to receive healthcare whenever they need it. So it was very lucky that we were able to see that patient today, let alone see them in follow-up in a clinic appointment. So something to consider is if someone has disclosed that they are currently being trafficked to provide a 28 day script for PEP, because that may be the only chance that they have to receive that script. Again, just briefly touching on the post-exposure prophylaxis for pregnancy. So plan B um, has to be given within 72 hours, whereas Ella should be given within 120 hours or um, if a patient is over 165 pounds. And it's just important to make sure that the person is not pregnant before these are provided. And then um, if there is follow-up concerns, for example, if the patient is currently being trafficked, they may not be able to go to SADV. So you can consider empiric treatment for a gonorrhea and chlamydia in that circumstance. I won't belabor the documentation as well, um, but there was a publication in the Annals of Emergency Medicine um, that was a guide to identifying an approach to human trafficking. Um, it is a US-based resource, but it is quite helpful. They just discuss that documentation is always important if you're suspicious for human trafficking as there is a chance that it might be used in legal proceedings. So under HPI, just including only the medically relevant factors and supporting details, a simple history can prevent insignificant points from being disputed in a future legal case. If the patient has quotes, put them in quotation marks if appropriate. The physical exam should be based on the chief concern, but if the patient has disclosed human trafficking, a thorough physical exam should be performed with documentation of signs of abuse using diagrams, but also documenting old score, old scars, sorry, lesions, tattoos, piercings, et cetera. And then in the assessment and plan, just documenting any inconsistencies between the story and the injuries, including the diagnosis as suspected human trafficking. In terms of discharge planning, if the patient is willing and able, ensuring that there is sexual assault, domestic violence follow-up, victim services can also assess, assist with a safe discharge. And this is a service that's available 24 seven. Their service is comprised of victim crisis assistance, and they can provide short-term emotional support um, non-judgmental practical assistance and then referrals to community resources, and they don't require police involvement. Um, if the patient is willing and able, then connect them with community resources for coordinated care. Um, as a reminder, even if someone discloses human trafficking, they may not wish to be connected with services, and it can take four to six emergency department visits to ask for help. So it's important just to re reiterate um, that this is a safe place they can come anytime. So in London, uh, we have uh, the wonderful uh, benefit of coordinating our services uh, through um, victim services, which is available 24-7 uh, to call if uh, a victim has immediate needs. Salvation Army, Caroline's going to talk about what she does there and, and her team. Uh, and at London Abuse Women's Centre, where I work, um, through the Phoenix Project, from which we are all funded, uh, we are able to offer uh, counseling and support for traffic victims for up to three years. And we know that, uh, as Rebecca has said, sometimes it's three or four times they come in to um, emerge before they ask for help. The same is true of, of our services. So they may, they may come for an appointment or two and then uh, not come again for another month or, or longer than that. And we continue to offer them services. So we just always meet the, the traffic person where they're at and, and try to support and counsel and uh, provide exit strategies. We can do safety planning for whatever situation that they're in uh, and also offer you know any kinds of support that they need in terms of reconnecting with family and friends um, and processing some of the trauma that they've experienced. Um, 
we also work with Youth Opportunities Unlimited. Uh, I believe that they work with youth up to the age of 24. Yeah. They have the, the benefit of being able to go out in the community so they can meet uh, individuals where they're at, at a Tim Hortons or wherever they are um, in, their, in their life. They can go to that location, which is a real benefit, which Caroline also does. Um, and they have a unique way to connect with youth. And, and what we find with, with many of these women is that a wraparound approach is, is really important. So if you see, um, if you see a victim in, uh, in the ER and then you are referring to one of our agencies, uh, we will often connect with each other and then offer support to that person uh, in the community in the best ways that we can. And we find that that is the best way to um, create safety for that person and to help them exit safely and to reconnect with family and, um, and get back into their lives in a meaningful way. Um, Caroline, do you wanna talk about what you do? Uh, thank you, Wendy. Um, we run, I'm running a program called Cornerstone Dignity, and it's for those who have been, are being, or, or, at, or are at high risk of being trafficked. And it also uh, um, is for women who identify as sex workers. So what we do is it's based on three pillars, and the first one is to build um, transformational relationships, which means they have relationships with women and people who want nothing from them only for the second pillar is to broaden the horizons because as i said the education level is not very high so we'll take them camping take them to museums teach them another start like learning spanish or a sign to show them that there is more to the world and other than what they're doing and the third pillar is to help them transition back into mainstream society and that can be something as simple as teaching please and thank you because that's never been role modeled for them. We're seeing the trafficking intergenerationally. We have collaborations with Goodwill who will give them work experience on the retail floor so they have something on their resume. Pathways will train them in a career like um, custodial services or business admin and everything we do is free. We have an online because of COVID every Wednesday night we meet online. Hopefully, we'll be back to meeting in person, hopefully fairly soon. Prior to COVID, in two years, we had 19 women exit permanently. Five were working and three were in school. And in fact, three of the women have just started college. So the program works. And of course, Street Level Women at Risk is a program for women working on the street only. It will help to house them. Sergeant Amy Birch is your contact there. And I'm telling you, she's fantastic. So. Do not hesitate to reach out to her. Wendy? I, I also just want to add the Canadian Anti-Trafficking anti Hotline. That, that began uh, just over a year ago, and it's a wonderful resource. It's staffed also 24-7. So if you are if you are questioning something and you want some advice or you would like to report something that you find suspicious, uh, that you're concerned about, you can you can speak to someone there. They have all of the resources that are available across Canada in each jurisdiction. So, uh, if you see somebody who you know is now moving to to Guelph, you can you can find out what uh, what services might be available in Guelph. So they are a great resource. Um, and you know, if in doubt, you can always call our agencies. But we don't necessarily we don't operate 24/7. The trafficking hotline does, and and they have the latest and and most up to date information um, for you to access. It's also anybody who's trafficked. It's a good number to give them. So if they don't if they don't disclose to you in the ER, but you are still concerned and believe that it, this person's being trafficked, if there's some safe way to give them that phone number, that's a good one to keep so that uh, they can call and uh, and if they want help exiting uh, a, an unsafe situation, the they will do that for them. Uh, I'd like to just add that Victim Services and Salvation Army Correctional and Justice, that side of it, we will come out and meet a victim. So if you, if the person in uh, Emerge is open to it, we will come and see them there, as well as our daily outreach. Thank you. So I think in the interest of time, we do have two cases, but I'm just going to skip past them to make sure that we can address our take home points and any questions that people may have. Um, so just the take home points, privacy is of utmost important. People may not identify as being trafficked and it's important to meet them where they're at. Use trauma-informed care as a universal precaution. 
the goal is to make the emergency department a safe place for people who are trafficked to seek care. If red flags are present, involve social work, inquire about safety and provide info and access to community resources. Obviously the SADV referral, police involvement to the patient wishes for this. And in adults, there is no mandatory reporting, but there are resources like the anti-human trafficking hotline that you can reach out to for any questions or concerns that you may have. Um, here are some educational resources that I found to be quite helpful while I was learning about human trafficking. Um, and I can send these out to anybody who's interested and just my literature cited. Um, does anybody have any questions? We can start there. And if not, then I will move to the cases. Sorry about the, the slides that are flipping everywhere. I'll just add that um, updated, there is a list of resources on FRED. It was last updated in December of uh, last year, of last year, I believe. Um, it, we, we will be posting um, a more updated list on FRED, which you can print out um, and access. So uh, don't worry, these resources will be posted on FRED. Can any of you think of a, of a a situation where you may have suspected trafficking and does any of this resonate? I mean, I'm the presenter, but I can start with one. Um, I remember seeing a patient when I was off service on psychiatry. Um, she was pretty young like I think just graduated to adult emerge, um, had I think 18 or something. And I remember encountering her, it was on psychiatry. So I'm spending a lot of time in there. And it was just one of those encounters where the person was really agitated with me. Um, initially was like, you think that I just want to get admitted. I just, you want, you want me to leave. Like you don't even want to take care of me. And I remember having to really like push that feeling of like oh my goodness I'm getting really frustrated down but I did and I apologized um, and it ended up being that she was no longer in a situation of trafficking but when she was in her last two years of high school like 16 and 17 that she um, was being trafficked and she had just recently come out of it and so um, obviously there's a lot of kind of like the way I was handling her care was asking a bunch of questions about her psychological safety and not really taking the time to try to figure out kind of what was going on. I just wanted to get my job done. And, and so it was really kind of humbling for me to realize that, you know, the way that I was asking those questions and the way I was providing care was probably like pretty triggering for her. Um, so that was, that was one encounter where I, I realized that I should probably be a bit more trauma-informed. I don't know if anybody has similar experiences as that. Can I share a case? Please. Hi, it's Mansaf Bamani for those who don't know me. Um, I did see a case of a trafficked individual. It was a female who had come in with a uh, query infected tattoo um, and these are, uh, as you mentioned, Rebecca, uh, important to look out for because it was a very odd tattoo. It kind of had some proprietary indicators, uh, like she belonged to somebody. And uh, so we appropriately treated this patient, uh, eventually got social work involved. Um, and, uh, you know, the red flags were all there, um, just looking out for those tattoos. Uh, she ended up leaving AMA and uh, no one could uh, locate her after that. Uh, so I guess there was a little bit of a breach in terms of being aware of this and trying to um, institute other uh, methods of keeping her around. Uh, but the red flags were all there. Uh, she did get antibiotics uh, before she left, uh, but then she was lost to follow up for a while. I kind of scanned her chart for a few days and uh, there wasn't anything that uh, happened after that. And uh, uh, she was likely uh, lost in the abyss of uh, uh, trafficked individuals, unfortunately. But uh, this was a couple of years ago before we had all this awareness. So if this was to happen again, certainly um, I would uh, be more vigilant for sure. 
And, and if I could just respond, I, I mean, I think what you did in that, that moment was um, create a, a, enough of a safe space that she knew that there were people who cared. And that is the most important, that's the most important thing that you can do in the emergency room in addition to treating the, the presenting concern, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, you know, it may be four or five times that they come back before they're able to uh, really trust and disclose what's happening and for you to meaningfully, meaningfully intervene uh, and, and create safety. But being able to uh, ask those questions in a, in a non-judgmental, respectful way is very, very key. I'd like to just uh, reiterate what Wendy said and that creating that safe space is essential. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it was a tough one. I think it was a difficult uh, case. Uh, you know, uh, seeing somebody with a uh, proprietary tattoo, I mean, you know, I've seen this in Iraq with uh, people that were captured by, uh, by uh, ISIS. Um, but to see this in Canada, it's a whole different uh, ball game, and uh, you know it was a bit of a challenge. Um, there's certainly more awareness around this right now, and uh, for those who haven't uh, checked out 401 Dark Highway, um, that's a good one to to look up. Uh, the 401 corridor is uh, quite quite the scene in terms of uh, human trafficking, and uh, we sit we we sit right there on that corridor. Um, so certainly, you know, the awareness has increased now, but uh, definitely a challenging case. Can I can I mention there is just there has just been a documentary filmed around London, Ontario. It's called Veracity: Stop Trafficking. You can find it on YouTube, and it's about what's happening here. It's very very current. Veracity: Stop Trafficking through City TV. I think. If I'm not mistaken, Caroline, you might actually be in that documentary. Am I right? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> thank okay. you. So I think we are past 10 o'clock. I just wanted to thank everyone for joining. I really wanted to thank um, Rebecca and Wendy and Caroline for an absolutely excellent presentation, um, as well as our partners that we're working with, um, with the consortium for anti-human trafficking research and education. Uh, we all work together. We have partners in OB, uh, gynecology, psychiatry. We're hoping to include pediatrics and increase these educational um, talks and sessions really to um, help everyone learn about trauma-informed care, as well as what's going on in our city, because it is um, quite rampant and we're, um, a lot of us are unaware. So again, thank you to everyone um, who presented and everyone behind the scenes. Um, thank you for joining today. All right. Have a great day, everyone.